Hi everyone, today I'm going to be talking through my top 10 hand management games. So these are generally card games or, or board games that use cards in them where you are trying to play through your cards as efficiently as you can by getting the most mileage out of them, getting the most points out of them, knowing when to discard things, knowing when to uh, you know, sacrifice things for others, knowing the order in which to play things and things like that. Um, I really like this uh, mechanism on, on kind of the way that it pulls you in different directions and you have to think about how you are going to play these cards to the maximum efficiency and maximum benefit. So let's get started at number 10. So at number 10, I have The Bloody Inn. So first off, this is quite a, uh, a strange game in terms of its theme. Personally, I really like it, where you are uh, an innkeeper and you ha constantly having um, patrons come into your, into your hotel or, or motel, I guess. And you are essentially trying to kill them in order to rob them of their money. But in order to do so, you're going to have to kind of in entice other people into helping you with your diabolical plan, such as um, getting the gunmen in order to kill them for you, or getting people to build annexes, or getting people to bury them for you, and so on. So it's, it's quite a, a strange and macabre theme. But the way that the card play in this game uh, works is quite interesting because... If you don't want to actually kill these residents um, coming to your hotel, then you are going to kind of bribe them in order to work for you. And by doing that, you have to uh, discard a certain amount of cards to do so. And one of the kind of strength of these cards is in order to make that cheaper. Uh, one of them is to make it cheaper for you in order to actually kill the guests. One of them is to make it cheaper in order for you to uh, bury the guests. And one of it makes it cheaper in order to build these annexes, which you need to bury the guests under. And all these cards have different abilities. Uh, and you, you essentially want them all and get this engine going where you can constantly do things for cheaper and cheaper. But the problem is that if, if you don't bury people by certain points in the game when these cops show up, then you're going to end up losing a lot of points and getting in trouble. But additionally, if you even if you have a successful turn and you have a bunch of cards in your hand, you need to pay every worker you've got working for you. And that could be really expensive. Um, and it's just about knowing when to discard things in order to do certain actions, knowing which cards to keep hold of, and it really is quite a mind-bending puzzle to get your head around. But it works pretty well once you get your head around it. It's not it's not the easiest game to explain to somebody, I think. But again, once you once you know how it works and you know the systems, it's a really good hand management game um, with a, a quite unique and strange theme that's well implemented. So at number ten, we've got the bloody end. Uh, at number nine, I have Hanuma Koji, which is a strictly two-player game. And this is a tug-of-war style game where you're trying to win the favour of these geishas. All worth different points. And you are trying to win their favour by having the most cards of a certain type uh, corresponding to the geisha girl, which is going to give you um, these charm points. And if you get a certain amount of charm points, you're going to be the winner. But the way you take your actions is interesting because you have a hand of cards... Um, I think you start with six or, or even seven by drawing one in the first turn. And you are taking one of four actions. And those actions are going to be things such as putting two pairs of these two cards, two, two, car two pairs of two cards down, and your opponent is going to choose first and put them on their side, and you're going to get the remaining cards on your side. There's the same, a similar mechanism where you're putting three cards down, your opponent picks one, you get the other two. And other ones you can kind of choose to save a card backwards or delete two cards out of the game. And knowing the order in which to play these actions is so, so important, not only because of the actions themselves, but because the, the actions that take four cards, for example, is just going to mean that you have fewer cards going forward in the game. Because the, the, regardless of how many cards you play from turn to turn, you're only going to be drawing one card back into your hand, meaning that your options are squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. And this really is a game about knowing, um, knowing how to... Because the margins are so small... And the, the minutia and nuance in this game in order to win it is so, so important that you can't just do anything frivolously. You can't just throw caution to the wind and hope that it works out in your favour because actually it absolutely won't if you, if you are playing against somebody who knows what they're doing. And it's all about knowing which cards to keep hold of, knowing which ones to let go of and so on. And even knowing which ones to get out of the day, game. So for example, if you've, if you've got one of these... Um, say a guitar card, which there's only three of them in the game. If you've already played one of them and you've got the other two in your hand, then you know to get rid of the other two because you know your opponent can't beat you, for example. But this really is a game you need to try out for yourself. It's, a, it's such a compelling and engaging game that uses a bit of kind of the poker face, but it's all about how you play the cards and the order in which to do and keeping your cool and hoping your opponents don't pick the ones you don't want them to pick. 
Uh, number eight, I have Red 7. Now, Red 7, I think, is a bit of a funny game. That, that I think it does something really well, um, but at the same time, it's not the... For, for a filler game, it's probably not the most enticing filler games because of the way it plays. So, it really is a game of attrition. So, at the game, at every turn, you are either going to play one or two cards. And these cards have uh, a number of different suits in, represented by their colours, uh, the red being the most powerful, um, and also in different numbers. I think they go from uh, one to seven, so hence why the red seven is the most is the strongest card in the game. Um, and you are basically either changing the rule of the game or you are placing a card down in order to be the winner by the end of each turn. Because if you are not winning the game or, or winning the round by the end of your turn, then you are eliminated from the, from the game completely. And these, these cards, are the rules that you're putting down are things such as, you know, who's got the highest card, uh, who's got the most of a certain number, who's got the most consecutive numbers. But the, the way ma the management of the cards go is, as I said, it's, it's very much a, a game of attrition where you want to stretch the cards you have as far as you can, um, hoping to draw cards when you can in order to outlast your opponents. And it can be really, um, it can be quite stressful and quite... Uh, straining in order to work out how you are going to play these cards in this order and not only by what's in your hand but by reacting to what your opponent's doing as well and often the margins are quite small in terms of just lasting one extra turn than your opponent but you've and if you've done it just right you think yeah I, I did that I worked that out perfectly uh, interesting game very unique and um, one that I definitely recommend ch checking out um, designed by uh, Carl Chuddock uh, so at number seven, I have Battle Line, which is one of my kind of classic favourite games. Uh, another strictly two-player game, uh, this one designed by Rainer Knizia. Uh, this one is essentially a game of poker played out over nine different hands, but these, these hands are only played over uh, with three cards. And the idea is you're trying to give the best formation of these warriors in order to win the flag. And if you win, I think it's five flags in total, or three adjacent flags, you're going to be the winner. But at any one time, you've only got seven cards in your hand. And knowing how to play these cards um, to, to the maximum efficiency is quite puzzling because you want to be optimistic in order to try to get the absolute best hands possible in order to definitely win the flags. But in order to do so, you're often backing yourself into a bit of a corner, um, meaning that you, you are dependent on drawing particular cards in order to complete those hands. Or you can kind of go for a bit more of a, a, a relaxed feel and try to get decent hands, but maybe not the best hands amongst several cards. But a bit like, um, a bit like Hannah Mikoji, this one does have a bit of an attrition feel to it because the more cards are played, your, limited, your, your options are getting limited and squeezed meaning that your options are, get, are becoming fewer and fewer. And often you are ended up, you know, where you've built something quite carefully, you'll end up just ruining it because you've got nowhere else to play this card. And just knowing when to hold on cards for as long as you can um, in order to maybe make your opponents waste cards is so important. And I, I love that hand management feel in this game. And, you know, knowing not, not to show your cards too early when you're confident in winning a flag, but at the same time, not clogging up your hand with cards that don't need to be there. A fantastic game, very timeless in my opinion, and uh, just holds up so, so well. That is uh, Battle Line by Rainer Knizia. Uh, at number six, I probably have well, one of the heavier games on this list. This is Mombasa. So Mombasa is uh, this, this pretty large uh, area control game with stock markets and shares. But this being a hand management list, I, I want to talk about that part of the game. So the, the actions are played out using these cards of all these different fruits and all, all these kind of explorer cards. But the way you, you play these cards is interesting because you are playing them in different slots on your player board. Um, and that when you play these three different slots, at least to start with, you can, you can potentially unlock more slots. You are not only getting those actions on them, which you can kind of pull together to get more powerful benefits, but at the end of the turn, those cards you've played are all slid up to the top of the board in their own separate discard piles. And then you're going to take one of those discards back into your hand, ready to play for the next round. And that is such a strange mechanism and such an awesome and innovative mechanism because in order to play your best hands, you're going to have to play them all together, which means that you're diluting them down into further, in, in, you know, into rounds going forward. And I absolutely love that twist, you know, knowing when to, um, when to take certain hands back, knowing when to put them all together, but 
ultimately separate them out from each other, meaning you can't play them all together, uh, at least immediately, is absolutely fascinating. And that's pretty much the crux of why this is high uh, on, on my kind of hand management games, because it just does what it does so, so well. And those kind of polarizing um, forces, you know, you want to have a great turn, but in order to have a great turn, you're probably not going to have a great turn next turn. And that just works fantastically and just a great mechanism uh, that used by uh, Alexander Pfister. Uh, next up, I have uh, Rococo at number five. Uh, so Rococo is um, a game designed by Matthias Kramer and essentially it's an area control game um, with some pretty simple actions. And the idea is you're trying to dress these noblemen and noble women up in these fine garments to go to a ball. Uh, you're buying different, um, buying different ornamentations and fireworks for this grand ball uh, and so on. But the hand management side of things is so interesting because you have a handful of action cards and from round to round, I think you're playing three of these cards. And these three of these cards are, um, they have three different kind of categories. So you've got uh, your journeyman, you've got your apprentices, and you've got your masters, represented by kind of bronze, silver, and gold banners on them. And only certain actions can be taken by certain ranks of these um, of these cards. So, for the, the basic actions such as gathering resources can be taken by your by your bronze workers or bronze cards, and you know, only certain real powerful actions such as drawing new cards or bringing new cards into your hand can be taken by those master cards. And additionally, you can get other bonuses by using those master cards. But the the fact that some of these actions have um, have oh, so cards have actions on them themselves, which you can kind of use to follow up your main action, is important. But it's all about knowing how to how to space them out and knowing what you're going to do from turn to turn, um, and just playing them in the in the right order is is just brilliant and it just works so so well for a relatively simple um, game in terms of its mechanisms as i said just a just a pretty straightforward area control game but that extra wrinkle about managing your hand is so so important and there are additional actions you can use as well to kind of thin out your hand or thin out the cards you're using in order to get points and obviously make it better to you know, not having to cycle through your whole deck in order to draw them back again so yeah, I, I love the way the cards are used in this game. Just a pretty simple use of them, but it just works well with those different tiered systems. Uh, next up at number four, I have uh, another Alexander Fister game with Maracaibo. So Maracaibo, a bit like uh, Mombasa, this one is uh, an involved game with lots and lots going on in it. But the, the main kind of driving force in this game is the card system. And these cards are really interesting because they, they have your normal things such as having a cost in order to buy them. But they have um, multiple uses. You've got things such as uh, quest items, or you've actually got abilities of the cards themselves you can use. And often to play cards, you need to sacrifice other cards. Again, you've got a hand limit, so you can't carry loads of cards through from, from round to round. You can choose to um, allocate cards to certain spots to reserve them to build later. But once you do that, you can't take them back and use them for their other benefits. And it's one of those cards about knowing what, when to sacrifice one thing for another because you might have a really powerful card that you, you want that benefit for but right now you don't have the, 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 kind of the funds to pay for it but there's a, a juicy quest coming up and you tr you've just sailed your boat there and you have the item to use on that card and you think, you know what, let's just get rid of that item which is going to lose me that cool power but um, it's going to help me get points in other ways. And I love multiple use cards, and I think Fista is probably the best guy at doing it. And yeah, Maracaibo is probably the prime example of that. The fact that it has, as I said, I think it's three different criteria on each card. Uh, one for quests, one for um, missions, I think, and one for, um, sorry, one for, one for the towns where you can trade in things for other things, and one for the ability themselves. And those abilities are also super cool. So yeah, all about the cards in this one and um, and just managing those cards is just a huge part of this huge game. Now at number three, I have The King is Dead. Now this is um, a pretty cutthroat area control game set you know, on this map of um, on this map of, map of Britain. And you are basically trying to uh, win majorities or at least trying to kind of invest in the different nation. You've got your three nations, you've got your Welsh, Welsh your English, and your Scottish, and you're trying to invest in these, uh, in these nations by taking cubes of them and hoping they win battles, because whoever's won the most battles, who you have the most cubes of at the end of the game, is, is going to be the winner. 
But the, the fact that the hand management in this game is so good is because of the fact that you only start with eight cards. And these eight cards are, at least in the core game, you are identical to each other player. And the game is going to play out over eight different rounds, or I think eight different regions. All reserved, all, all kind of resolved in a certain order. But you, these cards that you have at the start of your, at the, start of your um, at the game are uh, all you've got for the entire game. You're never going to draw these cards back once you've played them. You've played them. You can end up using them all in the first half of the game and having nothing in the second half of the game. Or you can do, you know, vice versa in terms of kind of really... Um, you know, weathering the storm until the second half of the game and start to use those cards to your advantage. But the the fact that you really want to use these cards to their maximum of efficiency is just an absolutely painful decision because uh, you know, people are doing things which you know you're not going to benefit from, but you end up reacting to them and spending another card and then you're quickly running out of options. You keep reacting to other people and just not knowing when to... Uh, knowing when to give up and let someone have, have a small win in order to win the war and not the battle. And I just love that pacing of this game where you, you, you do have to be really patient and know when is the time to use that card. And not only for its ability, which can be things such as you know, adding cubes of a certain color onto the board or moving cubes around or moving, even, moving, moving the uh, locations around in order to change the order they're resolved. But when you play them, you're also taking a cube off the board in order to add to your investment in those, in those nations. So. You know, if you want to play those cards early and completely stock up on a different nation, then other players are going to naturally move against that and make sure you don't win. But you can't just let other people run away with things as well. So as I said, it's all about the pacing in this game and knowing when and where to play those cards because they are such a scarce resource in this game and every move and every card is pivotal to winning this game with a very small margin for error. And that's why uh, the King is Dead is at number three. Uh, at number two, I have Concordia by Matt Gertz. And this is one of my favorite Euro games because it is such a pure and clean game as you are uh, collecting resources and buying new cards to get end game points. But the, the cards are interesting in so many ways because number one is that the cards themselves not only have action abilities on them, which you're gonna use to either move around the map or collect resources or buy new cards, for example, but each card is assigned to a certain scoring criteria on them meaning that, for example, if I, I might get a point for every uh, region I'm in for every Saturn card I've got. And obviously I'm trying to collect Saturn cards if I've spread the map that way. But at the same time, um, those Saturn cards' abilities might not be so great. So it's not only weighing up the uh, abilities themselves, but also the scoring or the way they're going to score points at the end of the game. But in addition to that, you are actually rewarded by playing through as many cards as you can. And you are when you when you collect these cards, you are, can really map out your turns quite carefully and dictate the order you're going to play them in in order to have these or string up several actions in in a row. And I think that level of strategy is absolutely fantastic. So, you know, for example, you might say I'm going to um, collect some money with this card, and then I'm going to buy uh, buy and sell some goods with this card using the money I've got, and then I'm going to um, travel, and then I'm going to uh, build a couple of warehouses and so on. You keep playing these things down, but as other people are going around things, they might be uh, going around the map, they might be making things more expensive. But it's all about as I said, stretching those cards as you can and trying to play through as many as you can because there is a, a, another card that you use called the Tribune. When you play it, you pick up all your other cards back into your hand ready for use again. And you think, oh, well, that's no issue. Why don't I just keep uh, playing a couple of cards and pick it back up again? Because you are rewarded by playing through more of them because every card in excess of three, you're going to get an additional coin for. So by the end of the game, if you're playing 10, 11 cards in a row, you're getting quite a big chunk of money uh, in order to do that. And naturally, if you keep just playing cards and picking them back up, you're not being very efficient because you're wasting a whole turn just to pick those cards back up. But I love that level of hand management. The planning and forecasting in this game is just brilliant. Uh, in addition to the, um, into the abilities on the cards with the scoring on the cards as well. Just a great use of cards and hand management in Concordia. Uh, and finally, at number one, um, this is the game that really just made me think of hand management straight up. This is Arboretum. Now, Arboretum, from the, from the looks of it, it looks like a very simple, pleasant card game. Um, and in a way it is, but in another way, it's absolutely the most cutthroat and nasty game you'll, you'll play. Um, the, the limitation on the game is, is absolutely uh, crippling because you are basically drawing two cards each, each turn 
and you can either do that from a central pile, which are kind of a face down pile, or you can actually draw from a discard pile from the other players that have accumulated throughout the game. So that's quite cool first off, so you've got to be careful about what you're discarding because other players might capitalise on that. But you're also trying to play these cards in order to create these different routes and tracks of these trees in order to get lots of points in different ways. But the hand management is so good in this game because every tree you lay on your board uh, isn't worth anything unless you have the most or equal, most or equal amount of those cards, or at least the value of the, those cards, in your hand at the end of the game. So in order to score something uh, and try to get a lot of points, you need to have some cards left in your hand. And that itself is, is contrasting because you, know, you want to get loads of points, but you can't get loads of points if you don't have some in your hand. And knowing what other people are having as well is so important because if somebody's got loads of, say, white trees down and you've got the, the white seven in your hand, you think, well, he's not going to score any points for those because I've got that white tree in my hand, which is absolutely brilliant. So you can be really nasty and just completely throw other people under the bus by collecting the cards that you know that they want. Um, but all this time you're considering that you only have a hand limit of seven cards. So those seven cards are going to be the ones that you're trying to play out. They're going to be the ones that you're trying to collect and keep for endgame scoring. And by the end of it, you just you can't afford to give up a certain amount of cards or certain types of cards because you, know, you need to score them. So it means you're going to have to discard certain other cards, which you know that other players want. So every single card in this game is is of paramount importance, um, not only for your own scoring, but from stopping other people from scoring as well, knowing what to discard, and, and so on. So an absolute great example of being restrictive, but in a, in a fun and compelling way, um, and ultimately in an extremely cutthroat way, because um, you can end up scoring this or, or winning this game by a landslide um, just because you've stopped other players from scoring a certain thing. Um, and yeah, and alternatively, you can end up scoring all your cards by not holding any of those cards just because nobody else has got them in their hand. So yeah, the hand management in this game is probably the best example that I've ever seen. That is Arboretum at number one. So um, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, video of my top 10 hand management games. Uh, I hope there's something on here that's kind of piqued your interest or kind of at least, you know, turned your head and wants, wants, uh, you want to check out. If you have enjoyed the videos, please hit like and subscribe to my channel and check out my other videos too. Uh, additionally, you can support me by uh, backing me on Patreon or following me on uh, Instagram and I'll leave the links in the show notes for those, okay? So uh, for everyone else, I'll see you next time on Chairman of the Board. Bye.